guys! Welcome to Historical Gossip. In this channel, we do what humans have done best since we've evolved to be a super aware being. Gossiping! Today, we will dig into what menstruations was like for women in the Victorian era, the medical and cultural beliefs, the methods used to absorb blood and alleviate pain, and everything that revolved around what still seemed to be a big mystery, the female menstrual cycle. First of all, for young girls in Victorian times, it was not necessary to have the cycle before the age was determined by doctors. If it happened earlier, it was better to hide it, as having the cycle early was considered unlucky and could lead to illness and even death. It was believed to be caused by an excess of stimuli, such as going to the theatre, have juvenile infatuations, or from listening to music. During the early 1800s, it's believed that many women from lower social classes didn't use any means to manage their menstrual flow. This was partly because they had fewer menstrual cycles due to more frequent pregnancies and, in some cases, malnutrition. When they did use something, they employed materials like sheepskin, sea sponges inserted like tampons, belts with pieces of cloth, or even tightly wrapped rags placed between their thighs. In contrast, wealthy women had the luxury of isolating themselves in a room and waiting for their menstruation to finish. Regarding the absorption of blood, the most sophisticated but not widely used method was the menstrual belt, a belt tied around the waist with a clasp to which a fabric pad could be attached. It's important to remember that underwear at that time was crotchless and open between the thighs. The age of one's first menstruation was between 13 years old for affluent girls and 14 to 15 years old for those from poorer working class backgrounds, likely due to poor nutrition. Doctors of the time connected a woman's mental health to the regularity of her menstrual cycle and often recommended avoiding physical activities during menstruation. Many activities, such as cycling and bathing, were in fact forbidden during menstruations for women. Medical texts of the time claimed that women were attractive to men only during the activity period of their reproductive organs, and so that their sexual appetite was poorly developed during menstruation. Thanks to this sexist mentality of the time, women were primarily seen as attractive to men as incubators for reproduction, and the cessation of menstruation was viewed as a sign of ageing, after which a woman's value was further diminished. Since women were believed to be unable to control their own health, it was the responsibility of the father, or the older male figure in the family, to ensure that a woman's menstrual cycle was regular and obstacle-free. Theoretical doctors of the time believed that the menstrual cycle was a kind of safety valve through which women discharged excess animal impulses, reducing women to the state of animals themselves this concept was based on the belief that the menstrual flow was the result of a peculiar and periodic condition during which the blood vessels of the uterus prepared for insemination, similar to the heat period in animals. Physical manifestations of reproductive function such as the menstrual cycle, pregnancy, breastfeeding and menopause were often used as biological justification to limit women's participation in activities considered exclusive to men such as entertainment and sport. During that period, initial ads concerning women's menstrual health emerged, primarily promoting corrective pills designed to regulate the menstrual cycle and relieve issues like feeling unwell, nervousness, dizziness, and so on. These ads weren't intended for women from lower social classes who often couldn't read. Instead, they targeted fathers or husbands who read the news. These ads didn't openly discuss menstruation, but subtly conveyed information, relying on authoritative medical sources to create fear and uncertainty surrounding the menstrual cycle. During that era, physicians held the belief that the body's balance consisted of the four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and mucus, were all crucial for maintaining good health. Consequently, they posited that the menstrual cycle played a role in purging the female body of excess blood, and any disruption of this cycle could lead to illness. 
Essentially, they viewed the menstrual cycle as a means to rid the female body of surplus blood. Should the blood flow instead of remaining stagnant within the body, it was thought to potentially trigger various diseases. Today, we understand that the interruption of the menstrual cycle serves as a symptom of systemic diseases like tuberculosis and cancer, but during that period, it was mistakenly perceived as the root cause. As a result, women took precautions to avoid activities they believed could disrupt this flow, with the primary measure being to prevent exposure to cold, such as refraining from cold water baths or working outdoors in chilly and damp condition. How did Victorian women address menstrual cramps? Victorian women sought relief from menstrual cramps by using substances such as opium, cocaine and marijuana, which were legally available and recommended by doctors during that time. These substances were frequently included in medical prescriptions of the time to alleviate pain associated with menstruation, childbirth or female conditions like neuralgia and hysteria. Herbal remedies were also employed, although the presence of significant alcohol content in these medicines raises uncertainty regarding whether relief was attributed to the herbs or the anaesthetic effects of alcohol. A more radical treatment proposed by an American doctor in 1872 entailed the surgical removal of the ovaries as a means to permanently eliminate menstrual pain. In conclusion, delving into the experiences of Victorian women during menstruation offers us a glimpse into a world where myths, misconceptions and gender biases shaped the health practices. As we reflect on this history, it serves as a reminder of the importance of evidence-based healthcare, gender equality and breaking free from the constraints of the past. Our journey towards a more informed and equitable approach to women's health continues, driven by knowledge and a commitment to dismantling outdated beliefs. And you guys, have any of you ever held mistaken beliefs about your own health?